As ISIS terrorists close in on a key Syrian border town, fears escalate of an attack on a much more strategic target, Baghdad. This is Special Report. Good evening, I'm Brett Baer. There are intense fears tonight that heads will literally roll in Kobani. The town on the border between Syria and Turkey is under siege from ISIS terrorists who have shown a propensity for brutality, including beheadings. And there's also concern tonight that the terror wave could soon engulf a city where so many Americans have fought and died, Baghdad. Senior White House Foreign Affairs correspondent Wendell Goler is monitoring the situation and the American reaction. As ISIS fighters moved through Iraq's Anbar province, gathering recruits from its Sunni Muslim majority, they were headed in the direction of Baghdad. But administration officials downplayed their prospects of actually taking the city. Iraqi security forces in and around Baghdad are strong. They're under constant assessment. Uh, the embassy remains open. We continue to conduct business. President Obama's aides made clear he was sticking by his decision not to put U.S. boots on the ground, and they noted the U.S. has conducted nearly 400 airstrikes on ISIS targets. The president's own advisors concede it's going to take somebody's ground troops to stop ISIS, but experts said the group could still cause problems in Baghdad. I think they can make a demonstration attack on the green zone. They, a lot of them would die doing it. There, it's not so much the American presence there, it's the government that is there. In Syria, ISIS pushed farther north toward the town of Kobani, where our Greg Palcott watched and listened. Appearances can be deceiving. Overall, the Syrian town of Kobani looks pretty peaceful today, but for the past couple of hours, we have been hearing a battle royal coming from the center of town. Just behind a long line of trees is the Kurdish defenders headquarters. According to our sources, the ISIS terrorists have taken it over today, but according to the combat that we are hearing from there, the fight is still on. Turkish tanks also watched from the other side of the border, unwilling to take on ISIS for fear Bashar al-Assad's troops would fill the vacuum and lengthen his rule. They want to do things like set up buffer zones and set up no-fly zones, which are targeted at the Assad regime, because they're worried that our actions against ISIS will embolden the Assad regime and sort of bring a lot of refugees over the Turkish border. U.S. officials said a buffer zone is not being considered now, but they suggested there was hope the Turks would step up. That's why we're talking to the Turks about what more everyone can do, including the secretary having two conversations with Prime Minister Davutol about Kobani just this week. President Obama spent the end of the week in California, mostly fundraising, including an event at the home of actress Gwyneth Paltrow Thursday night. Former Reagan chief of staff Ken Duberstein says Democrats might be better served by Mr. Obama adopting a Rose Garden strategy. He needs to stay in the White House and look like he's tending to business. That's what the American people want right now. They want a president who's rolling up his sleeves, is totally engaged, and is communicating not only inside the White House, but to the American people. No president wants to be held captive by events, and in Mr. Obama's case, the event, the fight against ISIS, is likely to still be going on when he leaves office. Brett? Wendell Goler, live on the North Lawn. Wendell, thank you. A growing mystery tonight in what is already that most mysterious of nations, North Korea. Where is leader Kim Jong-un, and why has he been out of the public eye for more than a month? Chief Correspondent Jonathan Hunt looks at what we know and what we don't. No one outside North Korea is certain where Kim Jong-un is, and very few inside the country probably know for sure. Most experts don't believe there has been a coup, and the best guess is that 31-year-old Kim is sick and doesn't want to appear in public. He's made no public appearances since September 3rd, and he was notably absent from today's event marking the 69th anniversary of the founding of the ruling Workers' Party. The last couple of times he was seen in public, in July and August, he had a pronounced limp, gout among the possible causes. A state TV documentary in typically breathless fashion recently alluded to a health issue. That narration saying in part that Kim Jong-un is, quote, lighting the path for the people like the flicker of a flame despite suffering discomfort. But if Kim Jong-un is physically weak, he's likely to be politically weak too. And that matters to the United States because North Korea is a nuclear-armed nation that is continually developing longer-range missiles 
rules. So U.S. officials always need to know who's in control of those weapons. Then there's the ongoing tension on the Korean Peninsula. South Korean activists released balloons on the border between North and South today, protesting Kim Jong-un's dictatorship. And in response, North Korean forces fired anti-aircraft rounds across the border, with the South Korean military returning heavy machine gun fire. These are adults who are killing each other, and some of them have access to nukes, long-range missiles, and large stocks of chemical and biological agents. And the longer Kim Jong remains out of sight, the more dangerous this situation becomes as the various groups within the North Korean leadership compete for power. So while U.S. officials say they are not overly concerned, they are watching this situation very closely. Brett? Jonathan, thank you. President Obama is not missing. He's heading to a Democratic fundraiser in San Francisco this hour. But he is conspicuous, conspicuously absent from actual campaigning with Democrats up for election next month. Chief political correspondent Carl Cameron tells us why. With her husband down in the polls and a growing liability for Democrats running for office, First Lady Michelle Obama hit the trail in his stead, trying to energize downbeat Democrats and their candidates. If we keep on stepping up and bringing others along with us, I know that we can keep on making that change we believe in. Democrats hope the First Lady makes a better surrogate than her embattled husband, who last week made his party wince by echoing the GOP assertion that the midterms are really about him and his agenda. But make no mistake, these policies are on the ballot. Every single one of them. Former top Obama advisor David Axelrod Sunday called that line a mistake, given how unpopular the president and his policies are in the polls. Nonetheless, the very next day, few noticed it, but Mrs. Obama doubled down on her husband's declaration. Make no mistake about it, Barack's last campaign wasn't in 2012. Barack's last campaign is this year. 2014. In Kentucky, that's the last thing Democrat Allison Lundergan Grimes wanted voters to hear as she runs against Senate GOP leader Mitch McConnell. Asked by the Louisville Courier Journal if she ever voted for Obama, Grimes sounded like a politician with something to hide. Did you vote for President Obama 2008, 2012? You know, this election uh, it isn't about the president. I respect the sanctity of the ballot box, and I know that the members of this editorial board do as well. So you're not going to answer? In New Hampshire, vulnerable incumbent Senate Democrat Jean Shaheen tap danced too when asked if she'd benefit from an Obama visit. She all but told him to stay away. The president's dealing with a lot of crises in the world right now, and I think it's important for him to continue to address what's happening with ISIS, to continue to address the Ebola scare, and so I expect him to be in Washington. Some Democrats have gone even further. Democrat Mark Begich of Alaska is actually paying to advertise his differences with the president. He took on Obama to get thrilling in the Arctic, and he voted against Obama trillion dollar tax increase. Late this afternoon, the First Lady campaigned in Iowa, where Republican U.S. Senate candidate Joni Ernst has a small edge in the polls. It's unclear if Mrs. Obama brought energy or embarrassment to Democrat Bruce Braley. Twice, she got his last name wrong, calling him Bruce Bailey. And she also said he was a Marine. Braley never served in the military. Ernst, on the other hand, served in Iraq and commanded Iowa's biggest National Guard battalion, Brett. Okay, Carl, thank you. The Denver Post newspaper has endorsed Republican Cory Gardner in the hotly contested Colorado Senate race. Among other reasons given for the endorsement, the paper criticizes incumbent Democrat Mark Udall for trying to paint Gardner as against birth control, despite his support of over-the-counter contraceptives. Quote, Udall is trying to frighten voters rather than inspire them with a hopeful vision. His obnoxious one-issue campaign is an insult to those he seeks to convince. Democratic Senator John Walsh of Montana says the U.S. Army War College has revoked his master's degree after an investigation into plagiarism allegations. Walsh says he disagrees with that decision but will accept it. He's already dropped out of this fall's race because of that scandal. Voter ID laws in Texas and Wisconsin have been blocked less than a month ahead of the elections. A federal judge likened the Texas law to a poll tax. The state attorney general in Texas says he will appeal. The U.S. Supreme Court blocked a similar measure in Wisconsin three days after an appeals court declared the measure constitutional. Up next, we'll show you what joking about Ebola can get you. First, here's what some, Fo some of our Fox affiliates across the country are covering tonight. Fox 31 in Denver with the latest data breach for a well-known company. This time, it is Dairy Queen. 
The so-called back-off malware affected credit card information at about 400 stores, including several in Colorado. Fox 11 in Los Angeles with the exoneration of a mother of three who has spent 17 years in prison for murder. Susan Mellon was convicted of killing a homeless man in 1997. The eyewitness testimony used in her trial has since been discredited, and today a judge ordered her release. The big story in KT, at KTVI in St. Louis, bracing for more trouble from the latest police fatal shooting of an African American. The death of Vonderit Myers has led to two nights of protests. It follows by two months the police shooting of another black man in the nearby community of Ferguson. That is tonight's look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.